Okay. Uh, hi, welcome to our talk about shepherding software dependencies. Um, who are we? Hi, I'm uh, Michi Kissing. Uh, I'm a software engineer. And together with me is today uh, Tobias Kuhlenburg, also a software engineer. And that's also basically the, the, the point of view that we're going to present this whole thing from. So the scope is like, we're developing software and we want to take care about software uh, dependencies. And we want to keep them uh, in line, we want to know about them. And I don't know if you remember, a few years ago, the internet is on fire. This was a, a big thing, you know? Hands up, log4j vulnerability, who, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so this was really a thing. So this was, had a huge impact uh, on the industry, and not just in classical software uh, companies, and not just in technology, but it, it spread out to a, a lot of other industries, and it, basically it, was, it, it made mainstream news. So there were a lot of uh, questions there. Uh, some of them were ridiculous. Some of them just showed, okay, uh, uh, people just didn't know what's going on. And suddenly they were aff affected by IT incidents, by a security incident. And this is, a lot of people were overwhelmed there. But of course, some of these questions are also relevant for classical software engineers. So, should I be concerned by this vulnerability? Should I do something? Uh, where do we use it even? And surprisingly, uh, a lot of companies and a lot of people couldn't answer that. So even if we have, uh, hands up, OWASP top 10, who has heard about them? Okay, quite a few. So we have this item in the OWASP top 10 vulnerable and outdated dependencies. And this item and its predecessors have been there for years. So this is not a new thing. This, this wasn't invented after Log4j. In fact, the 2021 edition of the OWASP top 10 predates the Log4j incident by two months. And the predecessors of this OWASP top 10 item, it was there, I, I, don't, I, I don't even remember when it occurred the first time there. So this is a known problem. Okay, but then what shall we do about it? And how big is the problem? So let's count our sheep, shall we? So, and there can be a lot. So I made fun, uh, okay, by the way, I'm not a, a React or JavaScript or TypeScript developer, but I like to make fun of it and this is just for, for the sake of, of, of having some easy target. I have a lot of respect for, for the JavaScript community because they also take security seriously. So this is not, uh, but it's, if you, if you look at that, if you talk about software dependencies, taking, uh, picking on JavaScript is just easy because I created um, create React app, a, a demo application, just out of the box. So go to my console, say create a new uh, empty React app, and bam, 1,561 dependencies. So these are actually, de uh, okay, to be fair, this number is also a bit ex exaggerated because there are duplicated versions, so it's uh, a unique combination of package plus version. But anyway, this gets downloaded to your machine. And if you ha have heard about uh, post-install scripts, so these packages will execute code even on your developer machine. So even if you don't ship it to your live application, uh, you will have these packages on your machine and you will work with them. And if one of them gets compromised, you have an issue. Uh, but also here, if you see that, first of all, um, the Node community implemented a thing like npm audit. So right now, uh, right when you install these packages, if you say npm install, you will get also a report of, okay, but how does the security of my packages look like? 
And surprisingly, if you, I did this, I think, on Wednesday. So you create an um, empty new React app, and you have eight vulnerabilities, whereof six are labeled as high, out of the box. So this is the baseline. This is what we're talking about. Just ignoring this problem won't bring us really far. So how shall we handle that? Basically, what we want to do is we want to identify dependencies. We want to store this information somewhere. And then we want to look for vulnerabilities. We want to look for issues. And we want to do that continuously. So if you ship a software somewhere, if, if you uh, create software, then what's already with NPM audit, for example, is relatively easy. You see, OK, right now, when I, I run my NPM com uh, command, I see a security report. But let's say you have shipped that application six months ago. Uh, how do you figure out whether this version that's already shipped has vulnerabilities now? So we want to do this continuously. We want to have some mechanism that enables us to figure out, OK, all the time, is there, with the, also with the uh, versions I've already shipped, is there something that I need to do? Uh, and all of that would be worthless if we, doesn't, if we don't fix it then. So <laughs> last step, of course, is fix the problems. OK, how shall we do that? How do we identify dependencies? And there's one thing that uh, I hope of a lot of us use. We have package managers so, and build tooling. Uh, they really know what our dependencies are. If we look at, for example, here, I have a Spring Boot project uh, with Maven. Maven knows our dependencies. We can ask Maven, print us a dependency tree, tell us, OK, what are the external software dependencies my software projects relies on? Um, and this is uh, quite normal for most of the more modern uh, technologies that we work with. You have that for Python, you have that for um, uh, Java, you have that for Go, you have that for JavaScript. It's still a bit challenging. How do you do that in a, in a C project or in a C++ project? So there are, there are approaches for that. Uh, there are uh, proposed solutions for that, but of course, there is more challenging because this infrastructure, this dependency management is not introduced in the uh, technology yet to that, in that widespread um, extent. Okay, so let's, let's make a, a check there. We know what our dependencies are. Next up is, okay, but what do we, we need to process this information somehow. We have, we have uh, in modern stacks, we have at least one backend. Oh, OK, there are, okay, again, the JavaScript people who think that we can uh, do the backend and the frontend in the same uh, technology. But in many projects, you have a backend server, a server client architecture, where you have a different language and a different technology uh, in the backend than in the frontend. So, it's, bit, it's, it's not easy to, to compare and work with things. If you say, OK, I have, I have to process the Maven output uh, once, and then I have to um, process the node, uh, the node uh, output uh, otherwise, we need to have a common denominator. And this is where the industry came up with SBOM. SBOM is a software bill of material. It's kind of similar with uh, what you have in classic manufacturing. So if you have a, 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 place, a, re, a replacement parts list of your car, of your whatever, this is basically a bill of materials. It tells you what does an item consist of. And the idea here is we have there a standardized format, and it's machine readable. So um, you can even transfer that with your product. So this is, again, in all this security and compliance stuff, uh, the United States are usually ahead of us. And they may mandate for certain applications already that a software supplier has to deliver this SBOM alongside the software artifact. And this is also where the idea comes from. With this uh, SBOM, 
not you, not only you as a developer can work with, but also your consumers. So if you ship this software to somebody else, they can also check that against their, uh, their databases and so on, and include that in their software inventory. So this question that we started with, am I affected, is not only relevant for us who produce software, but it's very, very relevant also for the users. If you ship the, if you ship the software to a thousand uh, companies, they also want to know, and they, they read the, the managers in the, in the news read, okay, the internet is on fire. So they want to know, am I affected? And a software bill of material can help us with that. Uh, right now, there are um, multiple formats. Uh, we prefer uh, Cyclone DX. Uh, first of all, I have the impression that it's gaining a lot of um, momentum in the industry, and it's really having a lot of support, and it's uh, fully open source. So the specification itself is open source and is uh, developed in an open source pro uh, process, and all the tooling that you will need to work with uh, Cyclone DX SBOMs is also open source. And basically, all major uh, security software vendors already support Cyclone DX these days. So how does this look like? Okay, this is too small up here. Unless, okay, right. The core of a um, software bill of material is you have a list of components that can be clearly identified by, for example, cryptographic hashes. So what we've also learned is knowing just a, a software and its version and a, a package identifier and its version is not sufficient. So if you have heard about the uh, XC tools, LZMA uh, issue uh, that came up last week, they compromised the tarballs. So the tarball that was created from the source code didn't look, the, uh, from GitHub, didn't look like the same that they um, published as uh, the release assets. So if you don't compare really the, the cryptographic hashes, you cannot be 100% certain that you have identified the artifact correctly. This is why from day one, they already started to include cryptographic hashes and in diff for different algorithms already um, into the SBOM standard. Because this is the only way to really identify an artifact. And so for each of your dependencies, you will have such a component in there. And then I need to scroll to the very bottom. Because there you then see, okay, you have one dependency and it depends on others. This is how you construct such a tree. Okay. I just want to mention there are two major points in t uh, or two major uh, ways of how you can produce an SBOM. First, you can integrate that directly to your build tooling and your build, uh, build chain. Or you could have a more generalized standalone tool that will do that for, your, uh, for all your projects. Um, there are pros and cons to both uh, ways. As a software engineer, I prefer the integrated to your uh, build tooling. Because my approach to that is, I am responsible for building a software artifact as an engineer. So I want to ensure that I produce a correct software bill of material. And sometimes for certain esoteric build chains, and we, we have also seen that uh, in our daily work, um, you need to customize that in order for the SBOM to be correct. And this works best if you have it in the, in the engineer's control. On the other hand, if you have a standalone tool, the security team from the outside can come and inject that to your pipeline. They don't need, to, need you to customize your build chain or your, your CI tooling or whatever, they can just say, okay, execute this tool, and then it will produce this SBOM. 
it depends on how you work, how your company works, how you pr if you have a, a, a one person, if, you, if it's just for your uh, hobby project, I would recommend imp in, uh, include it into your um, build tool. Because for example, if you, if you look it uh, up for Maven, you just include this um, plugin, the Cyclone.js Maven plugin to your Maven build, and then it will automatically be included in the verify step. So you don't, you don't need to do anything else. You just include the, the, the plugin, and when you build your software the next time, an S-bomb will appear on your disk. OK, so let's make a check there. We have a S-bomb. Now we want to work with that and have uh, something like, OK, how do I figure out now what's going on? And for that, I propose dependency track. That's also an OWASP software. It's open source, it's free. And it allows us to build um, an inventory of our software, as well as across uh, different versions and their dependencies. And we will see which licenses are they using. And th this is also important. This is sometimes an, uh, a bit an ignored issue in software development, you are responsible to ensure that you have a that they are compliant with the licenses. And dependency track also hel helps you with that. So you have then an inventory of all your dependencies, and when you want to do a GPL-free software, for whatever reasons, I don't like these people much, everything should be GPL. <laughs> uh, but if you are required to keep your, your code base free from GPL, then you would see here also in dependency track, okay, but I have dependencies that are GPL'd. They are copyleft. And then you have a problem. So it's not just about vulnerabilities, security issues, it's also about compliance. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. The, the headset mic uh, died today, so I have to... This is how a dependency track looks like. So this is the dashboard. Here you see, okay, vulnerabilities and this is not really interesting. Uh, in, more interesting is when you go to projects, because here uh, you see the two dem demo projects that I have included: one for Node.js and one for for Spring, so Java. And what you see here already in the overview is okay for the. NBM demo project, I last imported um, an SBOM yesterday, and it has um, six vulnerabilities, and the risk score is basically just a um, calculated value that is an indication. It by itself doesn't mean anything, but you can sort like uh, here by this risk score and get the the projects that have vulnerabilities on the top, and you can look at, at them. So if I open now dependency track, um, I have again here an overview. So a lot of this is you can screenshot that and send it to your managers and include it in some reports. It's boring. I don't care about that. But if you look at components, so you see um, dependency track already deduplicated a few of the versions and a few of the packages. So it shows us here 1,270. Uh, and you can sort that by risk score. And you see the license, if there is an update available, and the vulnerabilities. So I, again, I don't, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm not a, a JavaScript developer, so I don't even know what HES does. But it has an open vulnerability but no update available. So there's no newer version for that. I don't know how you fix that then. Anyway, you can click on that and then you get details. So if you look at the vulnerabilities here, you see, okay, there's a CVE open for that. And I can even go in there and see the details. You have, uh, basically it's a, a duplication of the information that you already see in the NVD. And this is also something that you, uh, need to understand, this works on available information. If you don't have um, any vulnerabilities displayed for your software, this doesn't mean it's secure. 
it just doesn't mean it just means there are no known vulnerabilities and there is no database that you are subscribed to where these vulnerabilities are included so there are even uh, commercial um, databases that you could include as well and that it will show you more uh, more information what i have enabled here on this instance right now is a copy of the national vulnerability database nvd uh, github uh, security advisories for uh, JavaScript and Java, and um, OSS index. And these three sources work quite well for the situations that I need. And what you can also do then, you can also manage your vulnerabilities depending on how your workflow in your company works or for yourself, how, wh what you want to do with uh, these findings here, you can also choose to ignore them. So this is for, for management, for, for bigger companies, it's, it's always important to also have the feature of, okay, I acknowledge this finding and I choose to ignore it. Who, who wants to do that can do that. So I've just screenshotted this whole thing in case the internet wouldn't work. So let's make a check mark. Because, uh, okay, I didn't mention that, but obviously there is a cron job in the background and does this loop on the top. So dependency check will continuously, every day, every hour, check uh, whether it can find new vulnerabilities for your software. Okay, and I will hand over to Toby now because Everything is worthless if we just keep these vulnerabilities with us. Yes, yeah, so now we're at the final part, and that's how do we fix it. And of course, one way would be doing it just manually, uh, but as you saw, we have around 1,000 dependencies in this one ex small example. And then just imagine you add something and add even more. No one looks back at the dependencies that were there in the beginning, and no one cares that 15 new versions have been released because no one goes through the list and updates them manually because it's just way too much work. So what we use for that is a, an open source tool called Renovate. As I said, it's completely open source, available on GitHub, and it's an open source tool that um, the target is to help developers reduce the work by automating dependency updates. It's available as an image, that's the way we use it. You can, of course, run it locally also. But yeah, we use it as an image, and how we do it is we use it as a scheduled job on GitLab, because we use GitLab, but it's, of course, available for, for all the other platforms as well. So what does it do? The first step is cloning the repository. That's very, um, every step is going to be very configurable, but I'm just gonna add that you can Enable package managers per repository. You can enable which repository one scan, obviously. Yeah, so cloning is the first step. Afterwards, depending on which package manager you're going to use, so this whole process is um, based on package managers and the package files. Currently, most package managers are supported, so every package manager that we use is supported, and, of, and since it's open source, it is updated all the time, and there are a lot of package managers getting added continuously. So after extracting the dependencies, they are looked up on the registries, and the versions are checked if there, yeah, if there are new versions available. And this also works with the, with the um, data source formatting that you have, for example, for JavaScript or Python or wherever. You have this, you have like pinned versions but it's, most of that is, is supported. And what's also cool, ex, uh, especially for, for companies, like where we also use it, is that private registries are supported. So if you have, for example, your own images or some templates or whatever you have, you can also use Renovate to update them. So if you, for example, publish a new image, that's a built image or whatever, that's used in a lot of other projects, after the next run, you can just merge the merge request and you don't have to like, roll it out manually. After that, for every update that's found, depending on what you configure, because as I said, you can basically configure 
everything, what you want and what you do not want. You can also group certain dependencies that if you want, like, there are some that always belong together and have the same version, that they are in only one merge request and not many of them. And yeah, afterwards, a merge request is, is opened with that version change. And then the final step is, is optional, but it's also very nice, is uh, auto-merge. It maybe sounds a bit dangerous, but it's, very, it's a very nice feature if you trust your process. And it's very important if you use it that your CI configuration, we use it on GitLab, and it only merges if the, the pipeline succeeds. So that means that the pipeline must not succeed if something doesn't work. So in the end, if you want to use it, it's, you are responsible for having good tests or build or whatever included there. But it still takes away a lot of, lot of work because especially if there are some patch versions that are released quite often, yeah, then probably nothing is going to break. And if you have a good, good test setup, then it should show up if it's not working anymore. Yeah, I can also show that on the real GitHub, GitLab. This is uh, on, our, on our GitLab a test instance, one merge request that was opened for the, um, the Node demo project that Michi was talking about. This is how it looks like. So just here we have the testing library React. It's included. We see that it... Currently, we have 13 top four, and there is 14 available. And what's also a very nice feature for, for saving time, if you review this merge request, is that the release nodes are fetched from GitHub and included there, so that you can, of course, this depends how well the release nodes are managed by the package, but it still saves a lot of time. And yeah, in the changes, you see that, okay, the package lock JSON is too big to be shown. But here in the package JSON, it does nothing else than replacing the version. And of course, also updates the package JSON, but it's not loaded because it's way too big. Okay, I already showed that. And then one small excurs is that, as I mentioned, it's completely open source. And because of that, I just want to shortly mention that I also worked on it. Uh, actually quite a bit. One thing that I, for example, implemented was a replacement mechanism, which we used. Uh, the reason for that was the deprecation of the, if I remember correctly, OpenJDK Docker images, because they have been deprecated and were used in quite a lot of our projects. And we didn't, we did, of course, you can search for everyone and everything and replace it manually. But we thought since we already had this tool and it knows all the dependencies that we have and already parses everything and it replaces the version, it shouldn't be too hard to also replace the name if you want to do that. So that's what, what was one thing that I added. And I have to say it was, a very, it was the very first time I yeah, had anything to do with an open source project. It worked very well from my side. It was also the first time I worked with TypeScript, but it still worked very well. <laughs> And yeah, just one thing have to, that I found a bit interesting is that it's, it's actually quite a big project. They have like 9,000 releases on GitHub or something like that. And overall, 14,000 pull requests that have yeah, merged, closed, whatever, but only four maintainers, which I found a bit interesting. But I still have to say that the response times are very nice, and I basically communicated with all of them and had a very nice experience. One thing that I just, of course, I don't want to complain because in the end it's open source and free to use for everyone. But one thing that was a bit dampened my experience was that after everything was finished, it still took like three months that it got merged. And it only got merged because someone else said, hey, I think this is cool. And then two days later it got merged, which was a bit weird. But yeah, that's, I guess that's just how it sometimes works. Okay, then that was it from this part and I'll hand over back to Michi. So again, if you use open source software, please contribute back. Okay, so we've done everything now. 
Uh, but of course, the whole point of uh, Toby's uh, part was we want to automate things. We want to take work away from developers. I'm lazy. I don't want to go uh, spend my time and fixing dependencies and doing this stuff. So we want to automate this process as much as possible. So we've already automated basically uh, this uh, with Renovate, the merge request creation, we've automated this uh, scanning for dependencies. So there are just a few things left. What we've already seen is you can include this generation of the, of the SBOM into your build process and you definitely should. So this is really important. Don't I've, I've seen suggestions that uh, people thought, yeah, I mean, if you just have a few components, you can write that on your own, open your editor. No, please don't do that. Never, ever. Rely on tools, set it up once, and then be happy with it because it will work for the next years. Um, and so what we want to do as well is we want to upload this uh, SBOM to dependency track. Dependency track is uh, developed API first. So it has an API that you can just use. So you see on the top uh, my poor man's uh, JSON generator. Uh, you just, uh, basically you just pipe an SBOM into uh, this JSON struct, base64 encoded, and then you can just curl, put it to dependency track. And you're done, that's it. That's all the automation you need, you're gonna need. And once you've done that, you have an end-to-end -end process in your CI pipeline Whenever you build your software component, it will automatically upload the SBOM to dependency track. In dependency track, you can then uh, whatever, uh, configure whatever alerting mechanisms or whatever notification mechanisms you want to have. And if you have that together with Renovate, you have an end-to-end -end process, very lean, uh, that will help you to improve your uh, stance on dependencies. So, um, and please forgive me, I, I don't want to classify you as sheep, but my buddy ChatGPT and me, we had a, a quite a good run, so uh, it came up with these images. Uh, you might ask, what are the problems with all this? And one major problem is, I briefly mentioned it before, we are relying on known vulnerabilities. So somebody has to discover there is a security vulnerability, and it needs to be included in a database. And one of the big problems is, once such a vulnerability is in a database, it doesn't go away. So these are two very, very good uh, blog posts by Daniel Stenberg, one of our, I think, the major maintainer of curl. Everybody knows curl, everybody uses curl. Uh, so this also means, now, everybody of you who will uh, ship such a, a system of, okay, I want to discover issues, and if you use curl, dependency track will show up and say, you, hey, hey, there's a security vulnerability there. You have to take care of that. But in fact, there is none. So this is not a security issue. So what I've shown you, what we've shown you, is how you can set up this process, uh, but then the real work starts, because then you need to somehow triage and work with these vulnerabilities. So it's easy if you can just uh, fix them, but what do you do then? What, what's the next step? The next step is, um, what is if there is no fix? We saw that in this Node project, it said, okay, this is the current version. There is a, a vulnerability, but it's the current version. What do you do then? Uh, what if you can't update it because it will break something? What if there's a regression in the software, in the patch? So they fixed the, the, the vulnerability, but they removed the functionality with that, and you relied on that. Uh, what if it's out of your control? If you're in a, in a company and not, it's not, what if it's not your open source project that you are solely responsible for, but if you have to get approval for each fix? I will not answer it in this talk. <laughs> this, is, this, this is where the, cha the next, next challenges begin. Future work. <laughs> so let's let let's go through the, the things that I think should be taken away from that. First thing is everything starts with awareness. Uh, 
don't ignore this topic. The, the, the issue with known vulnerabilities is there. Whether you care or not, it doesn't matter if you care. The issue is there. So you should know about them and you shake, should take care of them. And the bare minimum that we've shown you, especially Toby's part. So if I would have one recommendation. So on GitHub, there's um, a depender bot that already works. But if you are uh, in a closed environment, if you have uh, your own software, if you have your own infrastructure somewhere, at least re use Renovate because it will help you and your fellow developers of automating this, uh, this the thing of at least updating the versions. If you want to run the full th setup with um, um, dependency track, everything that we've shown you can be run uh, basically for free in this open source software, also GitLab. That's why we've chosen it. You can run it on your own, and we've used the, the SaaS version that's also in the free plan. Uh, everything can be done in the free version, or you can run it on your own. The only thing is, dependency track, you need to host somewhere. So this needs a server, this needs some infrastructure. Uh, if you don't want to fully automate it, you can run it on your machine and just manually upload the, the S-bomb there. Next thing is automation. Nobody likes to update versions. We don't like, this is just boring work, it doesn't add any value. So automate as much as possible. Uh, invest uh, a bit upfront into automating these things. And developer experience is a thing. You will only do, uh, and your fellow engineers will only do things that they don't really resent. And in the long term, my experience is this helps you also with resilience. If you, if you start using uh, processes and mechanisms like this, it will help you in peacetime already to prepare for the worst case when something, th something happens. So when the internet is uh, on fire the next time, you already have this in place. You know where to, to, to look and where to, to update things. Managing the, the supply chain. So, like, uh, if somebody would, would ask, would this help us with this LZMA um, XC uh, thingy where the, really the packages are compromised? No, it, it will not. So, it, it, everybody knows this XKCD. So, there's this little component there on the bottom. You still have to trust that. What, we, what we've shown you today is it will help you identify these components and tell you, okay, I am affected by that. But still, if you want to use this component, you still have to trust that component. This, this whole process doesn't take that away. Okay, again, and then when we go back to this, um, the internet is on fire. The day this whole log4j thingy came up, we surprisingly recognized that, okay, some of our projects would have been affected, but this, uh, this, the version updates, the log4j, the, the version was released, uh, I think one or two days prior to the, to the, uh, to the release of the, of the advisory. So some of our packages were already patched because Renovate opened a merge request a day, a day before and we already merged the fixes. So when this whole, the internet is on fire, came out, we said, oh, some of our packages are already patched and it's already shipped, it's already in production. They are not affected anymore. And this is where I hope uh, we will get as an in, uh, industry as well. The slides are already online. Um, all the, uh, the code and the examples are also uh, on GitLab in a public uh, group and you find it there. And I think we still have five minutes left for questions. Any questions? Okay, uh, thank you. How well does this auto-update work with transitive dependencies? So if, I, if the vulnerability is not in my direct dependency, but it depends on something, 
can I still update this in some cases if the direct dependency, for example, has not pinned the specific vulnerable version, I might be able to still update it? The short answer is no, because it's not under your control. And it's also, I would, as an engineer, I would say, I, I, uh, we've considered that with Log4J, because it's, this is exactly this case. You, you have a, a third-party software that some vendor ships to you, and then will you, do you really want to hot patch that? So the answer is no, not with these mechanisms, uh, you, uh, but you would see the transitive dependencies. So in dependency track, you see, okay, in this, uh, in this project, I have a transitive dependency to a vulnerable thing, but if you then want to patch it, if you really want to go under the hood and kick it out, and Renovate doesn't do that. So out of the box, uh, so in, with this auto merge and uh, Renovate will not, won't even um, open a merge request for that. Is Renovate only working with specific projects, or is it so like NPM or or Maven projects, or is it? For, for which projects is it working? Uh, there is a huge list of supported package managers for basically all the, yeah, all the common ones are supported. Okay. Thank so you. I don't know all of them, but for all the projects that we have, it works, and it works for, for a lot more, but it's, uh, there's a long list in the documentation. Uh, to add to that, what we didn't show you is it Work, it doesn't just work for the, for the package managers, for, but for example, also for the GitLab CI file. So in the GitLab CI files, you say, for example, run this build step with this and that uh, container image. And if there's a version with it, it's like, okay, Alpine, I don't know where we are at the moment, 14, and 15 would come out. It would also um, make merge requests for your CI files, for your supporting files, and say, okay, uh, in the CI pipeline, maybe you want to update uh, the Alpine version you're using. Um, does Renovate also have some kind of um, breaking change detection? Because sometimes there are updates versions which do not behave the same way than an old version. Um, and can I say, do not auto-merge if there is a breaking change? Um, you, you could now argue this is what semantic versioning would yeah, yeah, be so for. Uh, the more pragmatic uh, answer is your CI. So you should write your tests in a way that uh, it will detect breaking changes. Okay, yeah. But just at uh, like... A, you, you could train a, a language model for detecting, for parsing the change logs and uh, raising a flag. No, there is no structured information, okay, of, uh, this is a breaking change. Mm. Software vendors don't do that. This is what semantic versioning tried to solve. If you have a major update, it needs manual intervention. But the, in reality, I, I've seen breaking changes yeah. in a patch release. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And they, they also, they don't mention that. If it's a patch release, it will just break your CI. But they don't write in the change log, hey, this is just a patch release, but it's breaking stuff. People don't do that, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to add that the National Vulnerability Database for the last two months didn't analyze any CVEs, so currently it can't be trusted that well. So, go renovate. I mean, that, that's my recommendation anyway. If you can update things, please do it. I mean, the, the, the LCDME uh, XC tools was now the one example. If you update it too early, if you jumped to this backdoored version, then you're screwed, basically. Uh, that's also a feature by Renovate, for example. You can wait two, two days, or you can, you can configure at a slight time delay. So if a new version is released, 
you can tell it, okay, please wait three days before you open a merge request. We want to see if something bad's going, going on with this patch. So there are some notorious packages where you know, okay, you don't take the .0 version. You never update to that. You always wait for the .1 patch release because this is then the one where the, the issues got fixed again. And you can configure that, of course, in Renovate. But yeah, N NVD is at the moment a bit... So not just for the controversy with, uh, with, with the... They don't um, delete any um, things, but also for... They just don't work at the moment. I don't know why. Okay, I think we're at the end. Um, thanks for showing up and listening to us.